I am pleased to be with you again this week. It's been a while. Now, I don't think I really, I don't think that it was my fault, but when I was here last fall, the furnace was out, and now we got the house furnace out, and, here, I, and I'm back. I don't think I had anything to do with that. <laughs> but the testimony that God has provided for you, what a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing. We praise God for how he takes care of us, don't we? Praise the Lord. We are personal friends of the Andersons, so uh, it's a pleasure to fill in, give them a day off, and whatever they're doing, may God be with them and bless them. And we pray that the Lord will supply a full-time pastor for you. I, I know that's going to happen. We just have to wait on the Lord until his person shows up, <laughs> and then it'll all come together. And so um, <clears throat> keep praying every day. Pray that the Lord will take care of this for you. And uh, I, love, uh, I love the um, rural locations. I, it's just in my heart. I, I love rural locations, and I've dealt with many uh, not large churches, but smaller churches, and, and smaller and uh, rural locations. I grew up on a farm, and so uh, I kind of identify with this part of the country. And um, my folks were farmers in the state of Illinois over on the Mississippi River. And um, we, in those days, farming isn't like it is today. In fact, uh, my dad would do a backflip if he was alive today and see what's going on. But uh, uh, we love the church, and uh, hopefully today we can share something with you that will encourage you and bless you, mostly challenge you. That's what I want to do. I want to challenge you. And uh, we all need a challenge. I need one. And um, uh, we just pray today that the Lord will help us to find something that will minister to you. <clears throat> I want to start with a passage of Scripture. And um, it's in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, and at verse 25. And then once we read the Scriptures, I will we'll get it set up here and get started. It says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, the person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one who is coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the, while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if, the salt, uh, if it has lost its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile, but it is to be thrown out. We look at these words from Jesus and it's kind of amazing. He's saying, if you don't hate your father and your mother and your sister and your brother and your wife and your kids, 
You cannot be my disciple. For the English rendition of that, <laughs> because it's hard for us to put our minds and arms around that kind of statement. What Jesus is saying is, very simply, I must be first. That's what he's saying. I come first. Why would that be? Because he is salvation and our hope. If he is not first, then we're looking about other things rather than looking to him for he is the one that gives us help and hope in this life. So it isn't so hard when you look at it like that. It isn't like you have to go home and start beating up on your wife and your kids and let them know how, uh, how much you don't like them. That's, that's not what this is talking about. And then he goes on and he talks about building a, a whatever, a building of some kind. And he says, before you start building, you sit down and you count the cost. And, and he goes through all this. And so I just want to use some natural things that we can understand first today. So in my introductory remarks here, um, I'm going to talk about building. I'm going to talk about building, building, okay? Because that's something we can use as an analogy, an analogy so that we can understand better what uh, the Lord is talking about. So if you're planning on building a building, and we're talking about, let's just say you're building a building for your business. The first thing you do is you sit down and you say, what is it that we need? What kind of a building will serve our purpose? And so you sit with a building planner, maybe an architect, engineers, and you share with them what you're planning on doing and why and how this building is going to meet your needs. And he will go through the details with you, and what he will do he will put it on a piece of paper so that you can look at the paper and you can say, this looks like something that will meet our needs. And then here's the, here is what we need, and you have put this on a piece of paper. So now the person that's going to do the building can take this piece of paper. They used to call them blueprints. I'm not sure they're called blueprints anymore, but a print, they can take this document and with its notations and stuff, build a building exactly like you want. And there will be an estimator who will look at that building and look at what goes into this building and the engineer's report, and he can say, this building will cost you whatever. He'll put the number on it. This is building. It will cost you this much to erect. And so when Jesus said, if you're going to build a building, you had better kind of know where you're going lest you get into the thing and then can't finish the project. I'm sure you have sometime in your lifetime gone by a house that someone had started to remodel and fix up and then suddenly all the work comes to a stop and you're wondering, what in the world's going on? You know, why don't they finish this up? It's likely they've overrun their headlights a little bit. And so they, they can't figure out how to go about getting this work done. And so we have to, as the body of Christ, I'm go, what I'm talking about today is building church infrastructure. And uh, in doing that, we're not, it isn't about, it isn't about how big a church is, it isn't any of those things. There's one thing you need to know about God. He is precise in everything that he does. He wants us, he wants us also to be at our best in service to him. And indeed he does want 
all of our allegiance. He wants 100% of our allegiance. And so when we begin to think about the infrastructure and how it all comes together, we will look at it and see where we are. So <clears throat> we are making an investment. And this church today, you're making an investment in your building, your facilities, and your people. But you're going to find this out. Buildings are important and buildings are necessary. People are essential. In other words, our, our goal and, our, and what we're trying to do is not show the city our building. We're here to show people our heart. You get that? We're here to show people our heart. This is who we are as a body. It isn't about do we have the best facility on the planet. It is do we have the best heart uh, in town. We want to show people our heart. You know, uh, when, when we talk about building the body, the infrastructure, it all comes back to you and to me. What is it that I bring, what is it that I bring to the body of Christ that is profitable, not to me, but to the kingdom? What is it that I'm bringing to, the, to, the, to this body that's going to be profitable for the kingdom of God? We always think, or I should say, we often think in terms of what I give, and we think of that in dollar signs. I want you to know something. While that's an important part of building the infrastructure of the church, it's not the most important part. Your heart is what is the most important part in building the infrastructure of the church. Let me give you an example. Quite a few years ago now, there was a man that was, have, he was, uh, he was not a Christian. He made no profession of being a Christian. He had some habits and he was uh, certain drug control and things that were messing his life up. But he was working for a guy who was, uh, he was a sound Christian guy. And uh, this guy would come in, and, and they, this, this, uh, the guy he was working for owned a, uh, was that what they did, they had a car lot. They were doing repairables, and um, so they repa repaired them and put them out and sold them. This guy that I'm telling you about, he, was, he did the body work, and he was good at it. But he also had a drinking problem, and so he never had two cents to rub together. Now, this is his story to me. He told me this. And uh, he said, I kept looking at the guy who owned this business, and I kept thinking, um, how does he live like he lives? How does everything seem to work for him? He's got a nice family. He's got a nice home. He never seems like he's broke. He's always got, and he said, he said, I was asking to borrow money on the project that I was working on before I ever should have gotten paid for it, but he said, I was asking to get a, a, some money up front because I was always broke. He said, I couldn't figure this out. When he said, these guys always looked like they were peaceful. He said, I had no peace. And so he said, I said to the guy that I was working for one day, he said, can I talk to you? He said, yeah. So he said, we sat down together, and he said, tell me, what in the world's going on with you? You seem to be at peace. You seem to be prosperous. You've got a nice family. You are, you know, everything seems to work for you. And he said, oh, there's a secret to that. <laughs> this is what the guy told him that owned the business. He said, there's a secret to that. His name is Jesus. And he introduced this man to Jesus. He accepted Christ. He cleaned his life up. He now has a business that is just going gangbusters. And when you talk to him, he just tells you, this guy, I just simply watched this guy. 
And his life said everything to me. He, he was showing me. He, he said he didn't preach to me. He didn't talk to me about God all the time. He said he just simply lived his life. And I noticed that there was something different about him. And that's why I asked him, what is the deal with you? How is it that you have gotten to this point and everything seems to be working for you? And then he said he told me about Jesus. He said, I found Jesus Christ as my Savior. I've never been the same, and I've never looked back, and I've never been broke. He said, it is just one of those things. Now then, I want to come back to you and to me. This is what God is looking for in us. It isn't who can go around spouting scriptures, because you can know all the scriptures in the world, but if your heart isn't in tune with God and you're a person of peace and love that shows through you, it's hard to affect anybody's life. I've been, grew up in church from the 40s in a little one-room building. The whole church was no bigger than what you've got in a sanctuary. And on one side... There was a big old coal heated uh, space heater, furnace. And uh, when the cloud of smoke died down, when they filled the furnace, then you could sit down and enjoy church. And uh, I grew up in that. It was uh, an assembly of God. It was a full gospel church. And uh, in all my life, I've, you know, I've walked, I, you know, I don't want to tell anybody I was had perfect life. It didn't happen. I had a very normal life. But one day in later years, a man that I met and led to the Lord said to me, he said, you know what? I used to think you people were crazy. Really? <laughs> you thought we were crazy, huh? He said, and this is the truth, and I'm not bragging on me. He said, until I met you, you don't seem like you're crazy, but you believe in miracles. You believe in, in God intervening in your life. He said, I know you believe even speaking in tongues. He said, that don't make no sense to me at all. But he said, you don't seem like you're crazy, and I think I can follow you. And he did. And so what I'm telling you is how we live our life is important. It's important the way we carry ourselves. We're not here to judge the world. You let the Lord do the judging. We're here to show Christ's love reaching out to people. You want to build the infrastructure of the church? Be a model of who Christ is. Be a model. Show them. Don't tell them. Show them who Jesus is, and they will have an interest in following Christ. You want the church to grow? Model your Christianity. Model it. And so then we get along better. You know, uh, there's so many things to be said in this, and I don't have time to, to do it all, but what I'm going to do is, you know, the Holy Spirit is the source of inspiration and commitment. You know, we want to commit ourselves. Well, I want to have commitment. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Trying to, how many know that it's hard to be good? <laughs> I mean, if you're just, you just make up your mind, oh, I'm going to do this. Well, yeah. Or somebody says, I have this habit with drugs. I'm, I've just decided I'm going to change. Yeah, you're right. You are. But you're going to need some help. <laughs> but we, there are all kinds of things that, that crowd in on us. But the thing with us is that we need Jesus to be what we should be. We need the Holy Spirit working in us. We don't need a lecture from somebody that's a positive person and all this. You can have people that stand in front of you and give you this positive spin on life and all, blah, blah. You know what? And you get all excited and you're thinking, wow, wow. But tomorrow he's not there spinning the same story and you need something besides what he was just telling you because when you got somebody that's giving you this positive stuff, you're thinking positively 
And uh, I've seen guys raise a lot of money by a positive message, and, and two weeks after, somebody's committed himself to do something because they got all built up and excited at the moment. But the commitment comes through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you want to stay with it, you need God's presence in your life to make you what he wants you to be. So if we're going to model something, don't think you're going to do that on your own. You need Jesus inside so that you can model your Christianity. Now, everybody, probably everybody in this building has had this experience, and I had this happen just a couple of weeks ago. Went into Menards, who live in Spencer, Iowa. Menards, that's the main part of town. <laughs> that's where everybody goes, it seems like. But anyway, I was going through the checkout counter. And I usually have short conversation with whoever the checkout person is. And I was just talking to this woman. I don't know, probably retirement age. I don't know, it's checkout counter. And we had only said a few sentences to each other. And she looked at me and stopped and turned around and looked me in the eye and said, you're a Christian. I said, yeah, I am. I didn't tell her I was a Christian. I didn't tell her anything spiritual. <laughs> She looked at me and said, you're a Christian, aren't you? I said, yeah, I am. And I think we, as the body of Christ, should reflect who Jesus is. It says, we were reading our introductory here, that we, we have to put Christ first. He is first. And if he's first in your life, he'll show you. It'll show on you. It will be something that you can see, you can witness. And folks, if you want to grow your church, it isn't how fast you can run up and down the street and distributing tracts and what all. It's you as a person. It's your relationship to Jesus Christ that will bring the, the world before Jesus for commitment. It's how you live your life. It's how you walk with God. It isn't so much what you say, it's what you do. I think of that in terms of parents. You know, parents are always telling their kids what to do. Well, I'll tell you, the best thing you can do is model it. Don't just tell them what to do. Show them. And in the body of Christ, we're not here just to tell, although that's a good thing to do. We're here to show what Jesus does in our hearts and in our lives. <clears throat> Everybody wants, you know, you, you like to think, we need revival. Well, I can tell you what. You go into any church in America, and they could say the same thing. We need revival. Of course we do. But revival isn't a group of services that you have. That's not what revival is. Revival is is when your life is renewed, when the Holy Spirit renews your life. So that if the evangelist comes and he's gone, you could have revival after he's gone, right? Because the Holy Spirit is the source of that renewal. So if we're going to build a body with infrastructure, and I'm talking about the church body, that is the bones that makes this thing work, we simply need to focus on Jesus and the works of the Holy Spirit. And if you do that and you live out and walk your, your, uh, walk, your walk, the Lord will build his church. <clears throat> um, God can anoint gifted people to be effective in ministry. Gifted people cannot do ministry unless it is anointed by the Holy Spirit. You understand that? God can anoint gifted people, but gifted people cannot operate in the spirit on their own 
It, it, this is humanly impossible. You can't minister as a, a musician or a speaker or anything else. You can stand up and talk, but that isn't ministry. It's only ministry when the Holy Spirit, the one we don't see, but we feel and sense and understand, unless he's working, everything you say is just chaff. Every song that we sing, unless it's touched by the Spirit of God, is just singing. Remember when the Jews were in a foreign land, and they were noted for their songs? And so the people in the foreign land said, sing us a song, sing us a song. They said, we can't sing a song. We're in a foreign land. We're not experiencing the presence of God. We, those songs come when we are happy in our spirit and in our soul. And we can't sing songs just to sing songs. We have to have the inspiration of God. Ministry is the Holy Spirit working through a vessel. I don't care how good a speaker you are, teacher you are, whatever you do, if the Holy Spirit isn't working in that, it's just noise. So when you get ready to teach a Bible class, preach a sermon, lead worship, whatever you're going to do, we need to bathe that in prayer. Lord, may your spirit rest on this and flow through me to those who hear me. That's what building strength and infrastructure in the church is all about. We build up the body. I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. If we aren't spiritually fortified, all of the fancy gimmicks in the world is going to do us no good. You don't need a pastor who's the best looking guy in town, although that's kind of nice, but you don't need a guy that is just a silver-tongued orator. What you need is somebody that is spirit-filled guy on fire for God. That's what you need. You need somebody that speaks by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is speaking through him so that he can minister to you. You need the Holy Spirit in you to be the body of Christ. And when we are the body of Christ, we are the hands and the feet of Jesus moving about wherever we go. Now, Putting this in another, not in another context, but in a little different angle here. You go to church. Um, I've been in different churches over the years. And you know what? If you ask your church, you know, we need to be a friendly church. Now, I want, I want, to, I want you to hear me on this. Every church thinks they're friendly. All churches think they're friendly. Now, I would guess you do too. But, just, but hear me through on this. Being friendly doesn't mean are you friendly with each other. That's being friendly, of course. And I, it's wonderful that we are friendly to each other. What we need to be friendly with is to those that walk through the door for the first time. And if, and what I'm going to tell you is, I'm not criticizing anybody. All churches are alike. Um, in fact, uh, church where I go, they would say they're friendly. But I've been in and out of that building many times, and, and because I'm new, no one even looks at me. You know, not that I care. I'm not going to wilt and die. But my point is, if, if, you're looking for some place that you feel, uh, um, which I see, attracted to or a place you want to go, you want to feel like you're authenticated. And you do that when people reach out to you. So meeting somebody at the door and saying, glad you're here today, that's not being friendly. That's being official. You do that because we should do that. Everybody, every church should have greeters and, and greet and say, glad you're here. 
But when you stop somebody and say, look, I don't believe I've met you before. Tell me about yourself. Where do you, where do you live? What's going on with your life? You, when you start getting interested in them, now you are reaching out to them in a way that, that uh, they are looking for. They're looking for a connection. And you are making that connection. So when you see the new person come through the door, stop the person and, and get acquainted a little bit. Share something about yourself and give them a chance to feel like they have connected with somebody in the church. That's a part of the infrastructure of the church. And those are the things we need to concern ourselves with. Am I doing okay? Are you ready for me to? <laughs> okay, let me let me um, come to my last thing here, so that we we're not running here all day. Um, in the Mark's Gospel, chapter two, I'd like to read a passage there, beginning at verse uh, twenty-one. <clears throat> It says, uh, No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, it says that the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, it will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Now, Jesus set, spoke these words. You don't put new wine in the old wineskins. And I don't know much about wine because I haven't been exactly a wine drinker. <laughs> and... Uh, but I know this, that new wine, you put it in, it's fine, but then it causes an expansion, and if the wineskin is old and tired, it will break the wineskin, and the, the wine will run out. In terms that Jesus is speaking, he's saying, we can't, we can't have renewal in our hearts we can't put the new wine in some wineskin that is old what is he talking about now I'm old I know I'm old and I'm about to have another birthday and it's beginning to get scary but here's the thing people don't want to know about the good old days you get it? We have to be up to date. We have to, we have, to have the things that, are, uh, that God is doing now. We need to know what's going on now. We need to know how people's lives are going to be affected now. And so uh, we need to move out of, well, you know, I don't like to sing these songs we sing today. I, I want something going, you know, I want to sing the old rugged cross. I want to sing, and you know, those songs are wonderful, and they're wonderful to sing now even, but the truth is that if you're going to reach those around us, we've got to, we have to get with the program here and give people something that they want to hear. And so the songs we sang today, uh, you know, uh, those are great songs. They're wonderful songs. And we can live on those. You, you, it's just a matter that, folks, we have to, we have to move along with the culture. And, and uh, we have to provide something for youth. We have to provide something for the young families. We have to do all these things. And we have to kind of do it in their culture as well as ours. We don't need to leave those songs behind. But we just don't want to get stuck in a rut. We want to give them something that they understand. Here's, here's what I'm going to wind this whole thing up with. I believe there's coming a youth movement. And I mean by that, I am honestly believing that 
youth are going to get tired of booze and drugs and sex and all kinds of craziness, they're going to realize their lives are empty. But they need someone who they can identify with. And we have to prepare our hearts to be those people. God wants to stir something new and fresh. And we he can't put new wine in old wineskins. So it doesn't mean that the old wineskins are unusable, but we have to keep them refurbished so that we can, we can let the work of the Holy Spirit today work through us to bless those around us. And so the infrastructure of the church is important. You folks are important. Now let the, the God of peace and and the work of the Holy Spirit work in your life, flow through you. Lord, help us not to be judgmental. Let's leave you to the judgment. Let us, let us minister the grace of Jesus Christ to those that we come in contact with. Let us open our hearts, let us open our lives, that we may be available to do what God needs us to do in this day and this hour. You guys are very well positioned to take on this role. And God will show you what he can do in and through your body if you prepare your heart to give him opportunity to flow through you. Because it is only allowing the spirit to flow through you. Are we able to do this? We sit down and count the cost. Can we do this? Know this. When you serve when you serve the Lord, it will cost you everything. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. That's our motto, folks. We're not here to be served. It's wonderful to be served, of course. But we're here to, to model service to the Lord and ministering to people count the cost. Am I able to do this? You count the cost. Can I afford to do this? If you follow Jesus with all of your heart, the Lord will bless what you do and he'll bless your church. He'll bless the body of Christ because he wants to work in and through our lives. He wants to use you he wants to use you. Open your heart to be used. We're givers. We're not here to receive. We're here to give. Oh, I give my tithe. No, I'm not talking about that. We give of ourself. We give of ourself. And we need to give of ourself. Jesus gave of himself so that we could be saved. How much more we need to give of ourselves to win the, the lost? To Jesus Christ. You will be a part of that, I'm sure. God wants to use you right here in Blue Earth. He wants to use the church. He wants to use the people here. You can do this, and God will help you do it. Open your hearts. Open your lives. Open your homes. Open whatever it takes. Be a giver. Be a giver, and God will show you what the result will be. Count the cost. Can we do this? And we say yes. And the builder, you know, or those that are going to get involved in the work of Christ, our answer when the Lord calls us is, can you do this? You say, I'm all in. It yeah, it costs us. You know what? Uh, winning people to Christ can be financially expensive too. Don't make no difference. God has a supply. Now, he's already shown you this, this recently. He can pr provide when there's a need, and he'll provide if you reach out. He will give you all the resources you need to do what he's called you to do right here in Blue Earth because he's God. 